Guys, I just legit broke. I broke like my favorite plant. Look at these guys. Look at them. And I broke it. What's up, beautiful people? Welcome back to Chill Outdoors. I tried to film outside, didn't turn out too great. It's super snowy, super windy, super yucky, super cold. But you can sit at home nice and warm and cozy and watch this seminar by the Melissa Bachman. If you've ever thought about hunting or fishing and filming it all, like putting it on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, things like that, this is the video for you. Special thanks out to you, Melissa, for being super cool, letting us film. I literally just stopped her and was like, hey, do you care if I film? And she's like, let's do an interview. So. Go back, watch my Q&A with her if you want to be somebody who gets into self-filming, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, fish brain, whatever it is that you want to do. Make sure you stick around, take some notes. I don't know what Tank just did, that sounded disgusting. But hopefully you guys enjoy. If you haven't seen, we did a special, exclusive Q&A with Melissa in her booth at the expo. So, if you didn't get to watch that, watch that after this. But for now, take notes and enjoy. See you guys. tactics to self-filming. Now this is something that a lot of people have really started to get into and honestly one of the only reasons I got into self-filming is because I didn't have any money to pay a cameraman to come with me. So my thing was I wanted to go out, I wanted to do television. Uh, if I don't have anybody to pay to come along, looks like I'm the one to be doing it. So a lot of the things I've learned over the years are truly things that are from trial and error in the field. Things that have worked and, and either worked well or didn't work well at all. So I wanted to start off, in case people haven't seen the show, my show is called Winchester Deadly Passion and it airs on the Sportsman's Channel every Sunday morning at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time year round. So anytime you want to go on, 11.30 on Sundays, it is there. Um, here's a little promo of the show for people who maybe haven't seen it before um, to give you just a little bit of an idea of what it's about. I like to go out there, I hunt hard, I have a good time, but I like to show people that you don't have to be so serious. You can kill some really big animals, hunt hard. I bring my little puppy pork chop that was here with me the last time I was here, but unfortunately I was in New Mexico hunting as of yesterday still. Um, I was hunting Barbary sheep or odd dad there and it was snowing so I was worried about bringing pork chop along leaving her sitting in the UTV while it's snowing so she got left home so here's a little sample of what Winchester Deadly Passion is like start a lot of people will question so you hunt for a living that's awesome but how did you get started and really for me it's since I was a young girl my mom and dad I lived in central Minnesota I was raised in a very small town we went hunting on the weekends that's what we did in fact I didn't even have to go to school until 10 a.m. my entire senior year because my parents filled out a thing saying I had a work permit that my job was to go provide food for the family so I got to go deer hunting every morning all fall before school started so long as I kept straight A's that was the deal if I got a deer it had to be hanging 
in our garage, and I had to be back at school by noon. So that's one of the beauties of living in a small town, and, and I really enjoyed it. But it kind of shows you how much passion I had for hunting. I never intended on having a television show, but I wanted to find a way where I could hunt every single day. That was my number one goal, and that's now what I get to do. Um, the last few years I've been traveling about 320 days a year. Um, that's a lot of time hunting. I probably don't need to move to the 365. I think 320 days is pretty good, but I really truly enjoy it, and it's that's what I would do. If I won the lottery tomorrow, I may not have a TV show, but I can promise I would be out there hunting every single day, and I think that kind of shines through, and it also shows, you know, that's the type of family I was raised in. My mom and dad were nice enough. They took us hunting every chance they get. My dad still jokes that the reason he brought us is just because he didn't want to pay for a babysitter for us, but whatever the reason, it doesn't matter. We got to do that together, and some of those memories in the field, that's some of the most important stuff. So that's a lot of what I try to do now to get more people involved, is to go out there. That was my first trapping experience, trapping mice, but to get people involved, you know, get kids off iPads, off their phones, find something that people can do together as a family, and that's one of the things that self-filming, I believe, is really important, because not everybody wants to have a television show out there. Some people just want to film things to come home and show their family. Maybe kids that are still too young, get people excited and get them out there. And a lot of times I tell people, if you do have young kids, one of the best ways to get them started is give them a camera. Let them take photos. Let them film this stuff and don't push hunting on them too early. Because the last thing you want to do is have somebody that's not comfortable with shooting something and burn them out forever right off the bat. So get them out there, make it fun, let them shoot things and film with the camera first. Then when they ask, hey, when, when do I get to be up to actually do the hunting? It's a great way to really get into it. So one of the very first things I found with when you're filming yourself that's really helpful is to use a decoy. Now I started whitetail hunting in Minnesota at 12 years old. That's how old you had to be to get started. And we never used decoys. We didn't rattle, we didn't do any of that. We would do some deer drives or you just sit on stand. But what I found with decoying in deer is you know exactly where those deer are gonna be. And it's one of the most effective ways when you're trying to film yourself because you need to figure out where your camera's supposed to be. And yeah, you may have some trails coming through, but it can be really challenging to get those deer on camera. So by using a decoy, you know those bucks are gonna come to this one spot and you can have everything set up, allow you to draw your bow and make the shot. But when you're using a decoy, there's a lot of different things that you need to keep in mind. You don't wanna just throw a decoy out there and just, okay, call it good. There's a lot of things to think about. And for me personally, I always use a buck decoy. I like using a buck. And the reason being is bucks seem to not be able to walk away from a fight. Um, they can pass up does and they may take it or leave it or whatever, but when they see a buck postured with its ears back, and that's what these decoys look like, they just cannot resist. They think this is my area. I am not gonna allow someone else to come in. So one thing that I started doing is finding different ways, how to place your decoy, what scents to use with it, when to use use it and I've had the best luck right in that pre-rut to the prime rut time. That's when I've had the best luck with decoys. But it's really all about watching what that animal is doing. See if their ears are laid back. Are they going to knock your decoy over? Because I can tell you if they hit your decoy and it goes flying, usually they leave. So you don't want to let them get all the way to the point of knocking your decoy over. But what is also fun is there's a lot of animals that you may not shoot the minute they come in or they're too small or too young, whatever it is. But having a decoy out there makes it really exciting. It makes it fun to see all animals because you never know quite how they're going to interact. So I put together a little video with just a few tips for using a decoy to make you the most effective. Decoys are a really fun way to go after whitetails, but there's a few things that you can do in your experience to make you more effective. First off, you want to think about where you're going to place 
place your decoy. Now, even if you just set up a ground line or you're in a tree stand, I like to have them about 10, 15 yards away. What you'll find is it'll take all the deer's attention off your blind and focus it right on your decoy. Now, the reason I like to have it so close is because even if you get a buck that won't fully commit, maybe he's just coming in, checking out that decoy, you can still get potentially a 30, 40 yard shot with that setup. Now, the other thing, remember that most bucks are going to try to fight your decoy and come in head on. So plan your shot accordingly. Now, I've also seen bucks stand right in front of that decoy, pawn at the ground, and if that happens, make sure you have a broadside shot to take that animal. Now the next thing, what you're trying to do when you're using a decoy is basically fool white tail senses. You're fooling three senses with a decoy. You've got the sound, when you're rattling, grunting, you're bringing them in. As soon as they come in, they see your decoy. The next step is to fool their sense of smell. Now the very first thing you need to do, spray your decoy down completely with scent killer gold. That way you can remove any human odor that you may have left on the decoy from setting it up. The next thing I do, I take a bottle of gold and scrape, pour it on the ground and even on the decoy's hops. That way, you've got that fresh smell of the scrape in the area. Next, I take Golden Esters Extreme or Golden Esters, put it on Kiwiks around the area, so that way you're also filling the air full of that Golden Esters smell. So now you've got a wide variety of things, and when you bring those bucks in, don't get too pushy. You're going to have time. Wait till you get the perfect shot. That's the beauty of a decoy. They are locked in on it. It gives you time to calm your nerves and to get the perfect shot. And on that hunt, that was a perfect example of how a decoy really made the difference. We had a bunch of deer coming in and they were only coming through at night. They were completely nocturnal. And they were going from their food source, a big field, heading to their bedding area. And before the, they would even get started, they're already all off to bed. And there you sit. And all the deer have moved through. So I did that for a couple days and I thought, this is not working. So what I ended up doing is I put that decoy out and I got out there almost two hours before it got light and I had my decoy set and I had my blind set up and as I heard the deer walking through I just gave a couple of soft grunts in the pitch black I had no idea what was there and that buck stood from in the dark until it got light and he stood there posturing to that decoy never left and I never made another sound once he got in because the last thing you want to do when you've got a whitetail inside of 20 yards you don't want to be grunting in your ground line when your decoys out there they're pretty smart they can tell where it's coming from so what I did, made no sounds at all, and just let the decoy do its job, and I ended up having a perfect 18 yard shot as soon as I had shooting light. So it's just a nice way, not only to sell film, but to also really bring in animals that you maybe wouldn't have ever had a shot at. So the next thing I want to talk about is self-filming out of tree stands. Now tree stands are tricky to try to film yourself. If you're going to do it, usually I tell people, if you're going to go out completely on your own, it's much easier in a ground blind. You're sitting on the ground, you're comfortable, you've got a tripod, and you can situate how it's going to work. But if you're in a tree stand, I always recommend using some sort of a tree arm. Now as a cameraman, I was a cameraman for four years before I ever had my own television show, so I had a lot of opportunity to hang tree stands to hang stuff so how I like it is if the hunter is sitting here I like to have the cameraman just above them on their right shoulder and I usually put the cameraman stand their platform about where my seat is so it's not super high and of course every tree is different doesn't mean it's gonna work every time but that's my ideal setup then I like to have the camera off my right hip so if I'm sitting I like to be able to have that just like you see there where that tree arm wraps around so that way you can film and if you're doing doing it yourself, you can keep it off to the side and you can still draw and you can make a shot whether you are sitting or standing. That's kind of one of the key things is to make sure that you can shoot either way. So this is just a little clip about hunting out of tree stands. First of all, we're going to start off with tree stands. Now I've hunted in a lot of different locations out of tree stands and one of the most important things when you're trying to film yourself is have a good camera arm setup. But what you want is that arm to be totally stable so that if you take your hands off of it, it's not going to swing wide and go out crazy. It's going to stay exactly where it is. Now on this first hunt, I was 
actually hunting in Iowa. Now this wasn't something that I wanted to be out self filming, but my cameraman had a sick child at home, so I decided I'm not skipping those first days in November. I'm gonna get out there and I'm gonna do my best. Now there are certain times you have to make a decision. Either you're gonna take a shot and get an animal off camera, or you're just gonna film, because sometimes you can't do both. And usually, well, I'm gonna side with, I'm gonna get the footage, I will figure out a way to get it on camera, and I'm not gonna shoot something off camera. And that's important. If you're truly confident and wanting to self-film, you have to set that up. Now granted, if it's a 200-inch deer, yeah, things may change. But know that if you stick to your guns, you will get much better footage, and you'll be a lot more successful. filming in Iowa, I'm realizing that these deer are just cruising through and there's no way for me to get the shot and to get them on camera. So I just started filming everything coming through. In fact, I had this beautiful buck come in and there was no way for me to get a shot and to film it. So I just filmed the deer. Now after that, well, I was a little mad and I thought, this is ridiculous. How can I get these deer to stay right there so I can get footage of them and make the shot? Perfect idea, a decoy. filming yourself, one of the things I could recommend is using a decoy, especially if it's during the rut or just before the peak of the rut, because with that, you bring the deer right into the area where you want them. You can have your camera set up there, you can have it focused there, and you can wait for those deer to come in. You're going to have all the time you need in the world, so you <laughs> don't need to rush. You can get your camera, you can get your footage, and you can make the shot. Now the second thing you want to do is of course you don't have someone else who can get that real reaction of you. So what I like to do is I like to keep a small camera on my bow so that way that camera's facing back at me. The camera on the tree on, that's the one filming the animals in front of you and that's the one also with the microphone on to get any audio. So by having that set up, you're always getting any real things going on in the tree and that's important because you don't want to have to go back and make that up. If you're going to try to show your friends online, you want it all to be as real as possible and that's one of the best ways to do it. In fact, I started using a Garmin now that I put on my bow that's also paired to your heart rate so you can put your heart rate right into the footage. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. It really has amazing picture quality and to see your heart rate go from just a resting heart rate to skyrocketing when something comes in, well that makes it pretty cool. And you know, self-filming is for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes people want to go home and they want to show their kids. Some people they might want to put it on social media, show their friends, whatever the reason is. If you're going to go out and do it, you want to do the best you can. So these are just a few tips, things that have worked for me to help make you more successful. And I do love having those small cameras in front because it is pretty cool. It, it's uh, just a watch that you have on your hand and it'll show your heart rate and mine will go sometimes all the way to 170 within just a few seconds of being in time to, to make the shot. But it's cool to see that and it's just one little extra thing that you can add in. Now another thing is out of ground blinds. That's what I really like and I like to do the self-filming out of ground blinds especially in cold weather. Um, when it gets really cold you can lock them up. You can even bring a heater in there which is nice but one thing you'll notice is if you are trying to film or you're in a ground blind in the winter and you've got a heater going you're gonna see those heat waves coming up in front of it and it does make it a lot more challenging so sometimes what I'll do is I'll keep that heater on until prime time then I'll shut it off and that way you can really get kind of a mixture you can get that warmth for those times that are more of a lull period but then when it's time and things are really going well you can shut it off and you get some of the best footage that way. So here's a little bit about ground blinds. This was a hunt out in South Dakota and this is one of my favorite places to hunt late season because you have so many deer coming through. But this was one of those instances where when you're self-filming you need to decide are you going to shoot a deer and film it or are you going to just try to do it off camera if things don't work out. I was in a small hay bale blind. It didn't quite have enough windows and uh, unfortunately I let more deer walk by me that day than I ever have in my life 
But you know what? This is one of my favorite hunts I've ever done. Even though I didn't get anything, um, I had probably close to 800 deer walk by my blind that night. And when you can get that many deer coming through, it really does make for an awesome experience. And it was cold. a certain level of anticipation and excitement when you know you're going to one of the best blinds you've ever even heard of. And that Cody's, well, he was confident that I was going to get in there and he said you're literally going to see more deer than you've ever seen before. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of deer. And I'm thinking, okay, that's awesome. I'm in. Call me in. Even though I'm a Minnesota girl, I still get pretty cold. And right now, it is freezing out. It's below zero. We're out here in South Dakota. And the crazy part is, well, I'm out here filming myself. But between Christmas and New Year's, nobody wants to come out here and film. Eh, except for me, I want to hunt. So I'm hunting and filming. It's going to really make this a challenge. But there are so many deer here. It's a different time of year than I usually hunt. And I am really excited. out there and it truly was something I have never ever seen before. If I didn't have a video camera to showcase it, I don't think people would believe the number of deer that I was seeing. Well as I sat there, it wasn't long and they started streaming through. I couldn't even range the distance. But luckily I had ranged it before, it was right around 50 yards, and I'm watching one deer after another come through, and this is 11 days of hard work, everything coming together, filming myself, and all of a sudden that big muley comes through. I make the shot, he spins around, runs out into the field, and I couldn't even believe it. This muley tipped right over, and it was truly one of the happiest days I had ever had. This was so much hard work, so much dedication. This buck, this has been a buck. I have put more it's time into this. one of those things where on that one, I really got to the point of, I didn't think it was going to be possible anymore. And finally, I was like, you know what? Every single day, I've seen him cross in the same place. I'm going to crawl in that bush, and I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to wait for him. And it ended up working out. And that's what I mean by need, you need to be able to change up. You got to do whatever works. I thought being in the tree stand, that would be the key. Stalking, I just couldn't get it done, so I decided, you know what, we're going to try something completely different, and it made it work. Um, before I go on, I want to see, does anybody have any questions at all as we go? If anyone's got any questions along the way, just raise your hand and ask away. No questions? Okay. Um, one of the things too, for people who are self-filming, um, this is for people who want to put their videos online. Um, if you want to put your videos and post them and try to get a bunch of hits on it, the one thing that I took a class actually that was straight from YouTube is the first three words of your video are the most important. Those are your first three keywords and whatever those are, that's what's going to get you to search the highest. So instead of putting like Melissa Bachman hunting Colorado mule deer, if you want people to see it by seeing Colorado mule deer, that's that's what you use first. It's just some little thing that's online that can be really helpful to people who are trying to get as many views as possible. Now another thing, it's always good if you are trying to sell film, find somebody to help you. Um, that's the best way to do it. This is my little dog pork chop. She comes everywhere. She does not help film, but she makes it a whole lot more fun to be in the field. But it is important. If you can talk someone into it, maybe sometimes you guys can switch off filming. That's some of the easiest. You see a lot of people who will do that. I'll film you this week, you film me, switch back and forth. That's a good way to get footage. Self-filming can be really, really challenging. So it is always nice to try to find someone else to hunt, to help. Now, another way to do it, now this one, I actually had someone come with me, but I like doing hunts that are interactive. Whether I'm filming myself, whether I'm going out there, whatever I'm doing, I like to bring the animals to me. Because let's face it, when you go to them, there's so much margin of error of things that can go wrong. So this was up in Alaska on Prince of Wales Island, and we were hunting black bear. Now when you go after black bear up there, you're not baiting, you're not doing anything, you're just looking for them on the shores. And on this, I actually get dropped off for two weeks with a 
land, a kayak, and my bow and arrow. And they dropped me off, they throw me on the shore, and say, we're out. Now, here's your sat phone if you have an emergency call, otherwise we'll be back. Well, in my kayak, I had been scooting around, and I saw this bear on the shore. Now, the hard part about hunting on these shores is it is really noisy. And this can be with any type of animals you're hunting. When it's noisy and you're trying to get there, everything is against you. So if you can set up and bring them to you, you're prepared, you're ready for them. So what I've decided to do is to try to predator call these black bears to me. Now, these bears are usually preying upon Sitka fawns at this time of the year. The Sitka deer in Alaska are dropping their fawns and these black bear are killing them. Well, I decided to use my dad's old call. I thought it sounded perfect. It was an old Woodbridge call. I started blowing it and this bear from 150 yards ran straight to me at 18 yards. And I'll show this video, but it's probably my favorite hunt I've ever done. so I could make a good frontal shot because you have a very small margin of error on that. So this is about 30 yards. <coughs> At that point, I threw the call down and got my release on and got to full draw. <laughs> Because a black bear is going to want to smell you just like any other predator coming in. So if you can 
can keep it where they can't get downwind, they're going to come straight up that shore. And that's when it works really, really well. Now, a lot of times people ask me, well, does it work if you blind call? So you don't know if anything's there, you're just calling. I haven't had as much luck with it because when you're blind calling, you don't know where they're coming from and they're going to get your wind if they can help it, you know. If they hear it and they're out there, they're going to circle around the backside, they're going to wind you before you even knew they were there. So how I like to use it is when I can see something, I can set up, I can use every advantage I can because I know where they're at, where I can set up, and you can bring them in. So I think that's a great way to do it. It makes it really fun and exciting. That's still probably one of my favorite hunts I've ever done. I've called black bear three times in like that, and when they come in and you have a bow and arrow, you're going to have a frontal shot almost every time. Those bear do not like to turn and back down. They're coming in to eat you, so usually you've got that frontal shot. So what I try to tell people is on a frontal shot, you've got a margin of error about this big. So you want them in close. All three of the bears I've shot have been inside 18 yards. Um, that way you make a great shot. It varies all the way into the fletchings. They'll be done in 20 yards. They usually can only make it 20, 30 yards. So you want to really bring them in nice and close. My goal is to go do it for brown bear sometime soon. Um, I've shot some brown bear, um, but I haven't had a chance to call them yet. But one of these years I'm going to make it happen. But a brown bear, when they come in to eat you, you better be you better be ready. You better have someone else. Once you get older. Yeah, maybe I won't. My pro my mom and dad would rather have me not do that part of it. But uh, but I wanted to open it up, see if anyone's got any questions at all. It can either be about self filming or anything else that you might have questions. On. What do you call with? What do I call with? On um, that one I was using an old Woodbridge call that my dad had. It was about 30 years old. But what you're trying to emulate, I'm trying to emulate a Sitka fawn in distress. Um, what I do is wherever you're hunting, if you're trying to bring something to you, see what they prey upon, right? There those Sitka deer are dropping their fawns that time of the year. So that's what I was using. But especially with black bear, the more you call, the more aggressive, the more you go, the, the harder they'll come. If you quit and you think, okay, it's time to set up, they, they lose interest. They like forget what they were doing and they just move on. So you gotta be way, way more aggressive than you normally would. And I found that just because I quit calling and the bears, it's like they forgot what they were doing and they'll walk back into the trees. So if you just keep after it, it seems like you're calling too much, but it's really effective. And situation, what's plan B? Plan B is you make that shot. Um, no, I actually would keep a, a shotgun uh, mixed with buckshot and slugs um, at my knees, and that way if I need it, I grab it. The hard part is, to be honest, at 18 yards, if you don't make a good shot with your bow, you may not have time to get to that shotgun. You probably should have someone backing you up, but on these hunts, they were all um, just self-hunts on my own, um, so I didn't have that. Um, I got very lucky, never had any problems so far. Um, now I usually will try to bring somebody else and or at least have my cameraman have a, a handgun as well just in case but that that was my plan b is a shotgun with buckshot and slugs coyotes with a bow yeah i have shot coyotes with a bow but to be honest i don't do it much when i'm calling uh, most of the coyotes i've shot with the bow is because i'm deer hunting and i'll see one out there and i'll lip squeak them in and shoot them that way um, that's a blast to me i always got plenty of arrows so i'll shoot every coyote i see let's hear that lip squeak <laughs> nope, they'll come right in. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Um, that was out, right outside of Pierre, South Dakota on that winter hunt. Um, I hunt, it's probably 10 miles out, it's called Warm Ranches. And how it works is I just pay, it's almost like a, an annual fee and you can just go hunt there anytime. And I've gone there during the run, I've had great luck decoying, but that year I hadn't had time and went there in that window between Christmas and New Year's and it was truly the best I've seen. And their main operation is pheasant hunting, so that's why they have all that cropland there and they leave everything. And and it's for the pheasants, but the deer from, like I said, literally around eight miles will come in. And he also keeps water always ready for them um, so they don't have to, you know, it's not iced over. And that the water holds them as well. Between the food and the water, they'll all stay there for the whole winter. Any other questions? 
How many pounds do I pull? My bow is set at 64 pounds. I've got a 25 and a half inch draw. But I've been shooting a bow since I was five years old. So at that weight, I can sit and I can shoot. Um, when I go bow fishing in the summer, I'll shoot three, 400 arrows in an evening, and I leave my bow set at 64 pounds for bow fishing. Not because you need that, but I think it's a great way to just build up that muscle and to keep that muscle memory always going. It's a great, good way in the summer to keep that strength, and so much of it is core strength and uh, so that's what I did. But to start shooting a bow, at 12 years old I had to pull 40 pounds. That was Minnesota's legal requirements. And I wasn't strong enough, so for a year I did push-ups non-stop and got tough enough to pull 40 pounds, so. What um, I shoot, uh, so it's about 23. Anybody else? Okay, well thank all of you guys for coming. I've got another one at 7, but I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you.